In this video, we're going to see how we can configure the back channel UART on the FR6989 board. This is the board here. And this is what we're planning on doing. We're going to configure the back channel UART. Uh, again, this is the board's name. And we're going to use the most popular configuration. So here it is. We're going to be setting 9,600 baud. The data would be 8 bit, 8 bit, uh, no parity, one stop bit, transmitting LSB first, and no flow control. And um, uh, first, let's look at what the back channel UART is here. So uh, basically, this is the UART that goes from the microcontroller uh, all the way to the computer over the USB port. So back channel UART is kind of the, it goes through the pins, through the jumpers, through this chip, and uh, uh, through the uh, USB connector and all the way to the computer. So that's really uh, what the back channel UART is. So we can open an application and see the data in there. Uh, inside the microcontroller, we have a clock readily available called SMCLK. This is the submaster clock. It's running at one. 0 0.00 megahertz. And we're going to basically start with that clock and configure it to get 9,600 baud. So that clock would have to be divided and modulated. And we're also going to use the oversampling feature of UART, which will be uh, which will be running at 16 times the baud rate. Now that makes the communication a bit more reliable. So this will be our guide here. And the first step we need to do is we need to figure uh, where the back channel UART is mapped to. So basically, on this launchpad board, we have the communication module called EUSCI, Enhanced Universal Serial Communication Interface. And that guy implements UART, I2C, and SPI. It really implements all the three, maybe even a couple more communication protocols. So let's see how we can uh, 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 configure uh, this one for UART. So first thing I'm going to do here, uh, I'm going to search for back channel UART. And my goal is to see to which module it is mapped. Because that chip in here, it has multiple EUSCI module. This is considered an advanced chip. So it may have two or three communication modules. So I want to understand to which uh, module the back channel UART is mapped to. So uh, this is a launchpad user's guide. So I'm going to search here for back channel UART. I think back channel is enough to search for this. And um, let me zoom in a little bit. All right. So let's go here. Uh, this is simply describing the back channel UART that it is easy to talk to the PC. Uh, another description here on this page. And let's see what we have here. OK, this is the information we're looking for. The back channel UART is the UART on EUSCI underscore A1. So I'm going to write this here. Uh, back channel UART is the one on USCI underscore A1. And what that really means, this is, uh, this is EUSCI. Uh, module number one, there's a module number zero, and there's a module number one. So we're going to be at the module number one and channel A. EUSCI has two channels. Channel A is considered asynchronous and supports UART and SPI. And channel B supports I2C and SPI. It's considered the synchronous channel. So it's not a surprise to me. It's the channel A because UART only is supported on the channel A. So we kind of expect it's going to be channel A, but obviously it's very important to know it's going to be module number one, right? So I'm going to highlight this. That's really what we're going to be dealing with. Uh, uh, module number one, channel A, that's our back channel UART. So the next thing we're going to be doing is we're going to have to reroute the pins. Uh, uh, actually, we may have, yeah, we may have this figure here. Uh, 
the pins usually have multiple functions. And if we zoom in here, uh, you can see that the pin has multiple functions like uh, this pin here works as P74 SMCLK S13. So it has a multiple functions and we're gonna find where the uh, where USCI underscore A1 is at so that these pins are configured correctly. Otherwise we won't be able, uh, we're not ready to use those pins. So we gotta be able to use those pins. So this will be the second part to take care of the pin. What I'm gonna do now, I'm gonna switch to the chips data sheet and I'm gonna look at the pin out picture. I already was looking at the pin out. The pin out is replicated here, but let me do that here in the chips data sheet. The pin out is, uh, uh, oh, sorry, I don't have that open. Let me take care of this. I'm gonna find the chips data sheet. <coughs> All right, here's the chips data sheet file. And somewhere on the first few pages, uh, we're gonna find uh, the pin out. Uh, actually, uh, uh, let me see here. Yeah, this page summarizes the communication modules. This is our first chip and uh, yeah, you could see here, we have two USCI modules, the zero and the one. So we only have two of them, but anyways. So this is the pin out chip, uh, the pin out of that chip. And what we're looking at here, usually they are called TXD and RXD, transmit data and receive data. So it's gonna be some of these guys. So. Uh, let me zoom in here. Uh, I'm going to stick with the 100 pin because I have the 100 pin variety. That's the 80 pin. So I'm going to zoom in here. And I already searched for these before, so I have them highlighted. And here is what stands out. This is what we want. UCA1 RXD. That basically means USCI channel A module 1 RXD and TXD. So that's consistent with what we are looking for. So this is the transmit and this is the receive. They are on pin 87, 88. And what really matters in this chip is which GPIO they overlap with. They overlap with P54, P55. Let me copy this to here, the pin mapping. So uh, UCA1RXD. Again, that's EUSCI channel A module one receive data, right? Which is exactly what we want. Channel A module one. So that's the guy here. And that overlaps with P55. Okay, we're gonna write this down. Now UCA1 TXD, UCA1 TXD overlaps with P54. So that's information we really need. So we are able to to reroute the pins because in MSP430, the pins will be this by default. The pins are GPIO by default. So we have to divert the pins so, so that UART could work. If you don't do anything, the pins won't be UART, will be this. Now, here's another interesting thing. In most other chips, once you find it, you will be done. However, in this chip, when I looked for them, I got a nice surprise. I found them again. So that's really not good because now we are gonna have to figure out which one to use. Look what we have here. UCA1 TXD is also over overlapping with P34. So TXD also overlaps with P34 and UCA1 RXD also overlaps with P35. Uh, there are a lot of pins here if you search again, you're not gonna find them. So I only find them in both places. But that's actually gonna be a bit of confusion for us because which one am I gonna be based on? Am I gonna divert these guys, which are pin 40, 41? Or am I gonna divert these guys, which will be 87, 88? Remember that the back channel you are is a physical connection. So which wires did they tap into to send it back to the computer? Did they tap into these wires or did they tap into these wires? Uh, so it has to be one way. If you were configuring to another chip, you could use either, but this hardware wiring is already done. 
we need to figure out which one is done. This is a question of the board. So now I'm going to go back to the board user's guide, right? We're going to figure out uh, what's going over UART. And by the way, there are jumpers. If you see here, there are jumpers called RXD and TXD. So the two things we're looking for, the two wires, they actually go through the two jumpers. So I need to know to which pins they are going to. Typically in such a question, I look at the schematic, which is provided at the very end. There's nothing more helpful than the schematic. It's very clear and show you where everything is connected. So I'm gonna be looking for these jumpers. And let me see where the jumpers are. Okay, these are the jumpers. These are the jumpers we were looking at. Let me zoom in on the jumpers. So when I zoom in on the jumpers, uh, MSPs 430, microcontroller is to that side and this is going to the top part of the board the emulation and look what we see here i see that the txd and rxd of the back channel uart are going to p34 p35 so that clears it up okay so it's gonna be p34 p35 so i'm gonna go here and highlight these two that's what we're gonna be rerouting or diverting to this functionality. And I think we're pretty much done with this file, the Launchpad user's guide. This file was very helpful. It told us two things, that the back channel is on this module, and these are the pins that we are actually picking out of the two options. So what we're gonna do next, I'm gonna go back to the chips data sheet because it's gonna show me how to divert these pins. And this is usually through a bunch of tables that are somewhere in the middle of the data sheet. So I'm going to scroll to the middle of the data sheet. And there's going to be so many tables, you can't miss them. These are the tables. You see how many tables? They all look very similar. There is a description of the circuit and bunch of tables how to divert. So let me find P34, P35. This is P6. So it's got to be earlier. All right, here we, here we are, P34, P35. I have looked these things earlier. So this is what it's saying. P34 has so many functionalities. You can see these in the pin out picture. P35 has so many functionalities. And we're going to pick this function, UCA1TXD, UCA1RXD. So I'm going to write these down in my file. So we have P3 direction. So P3 direction. It's going to be don't care. So I'm just, I'm just going to write XX. P3 select one is going to be zero, zero. Usually they are the same. So P3 select one, I'm going to write zero, zero. And P3 select zero is going to be one, one. Now, there are two other things called the LCD segment because these pins can also be used for the LCD segment is marked here as SZ, S index Z. Uh, usually these are turned to zero by default. So what I found out, I don't have to mess with them. Otherwise, if it didn't work, then probably we have to go to the LCD controller configurator and try to change these to zero. But I did find out these are zero by default. So that make our job easier. So we have to take care of these two. The default is GPIO functionality. So I know the select one, select zero, they will both be zero by default. So let's take care of this. Before we do that, let's look very quickly to see what really these guys do. P1 direction, or in that case, P3 direction. Port 3, right? We are concerned here with port 3. Port 3 direction has multiple variables that changes the functions of the pins. So P3 direction has 8-bit. P3 select 1 has 8-bit and P3 select zero is another 8-bit variable. And now if you look at the same bit location, so I wrote this W at bit index zero, right? The rightmost is bit zero, the leftmost is bit seven. So now if you look at bit location zero, you have three bits, two to the power three is eight. And that means the port three bit location zero 
can have eight different functionalities by changing the values of these guys, right? You could see the bit zero has three bits, two to the three is eight, so eight different functionalities. These are the functionalities. You see that the bits number four, it can be used as this or this or this or this or this. It has a multiple function. So this is really what we're trying to do here. That's why uh, we need to go to bit four and bit five. So this is a bit four here, and this is a bit four here. Uh, let me highlight bit four and bit five, right? So we're gonna go to bit four and bit five and enforce the following. And once we do that, these pins will become UCA1TXT, UCA1RXT, and the pins will be considered diverted. Let me put this into code. So what I found in here is gonna become code. This is don't care. I'm not gonna change it. So now P3, select one. I'm gonna put two zeros and these two zeros are gonna go at bit location four and five. It's gonna follow the GPIO, right? So like we visualize it here, we're going to bit four and bit five and changing both of them to zero uh, in this case. So and equal inverse bit four or bit five. So that takes care of this guy. Let's do now the next thing. Now, this obviously will be P3, right? P3 select one, P3 select zero. P3 select uh, zero. I need to put two ones. So or equal bit four or uh, bit five. Again, why P3? Because these are P3, right? Port three. So having done so, now the bits have been diverted. So that's obviously the first part of the code that we that we that we wrote, right? Now the pins have been have considered are considered diverted to you. What we're gonna do next, we're gonna go to EUSCI module, we're gonna turn it on, we're gonna configure it in UART, and we're gonna configure all of these items, right? That's the popular UART configuration we're after. So now we have to look at how we can configure EUSCI to enforce all of these, and then we can start to use that. So I'm done with the data sheet now. I'm gonna go to the family user's guide. The family user's guide has a chapter on every module. So I'm gonna find the chapter called EUSCI UART mode, somewhere toward the end. Uh, so these are all the modules, and that's what I'm looking for. EUSCI in UART mode. You could see that's another chapter in SPI mode or I swear C mode. So we're gonna be at chapter 30. So what that chapter has, it will describe all the UART operation. And at the very end of it, it has the configuration registers, right? Because at the end of the day, when you configure EUSCI, it has a bunch of configuration registers. You have to look at the fields to set the baud rate, 8-bit data, LSB first. All of that is going to be in these configuration registers. And typically, we're only going to use the first two. These are maybe some other features we may not necessarily need. So we really don't have to deal with all of these registers. The first two are the most important ones. So accordingly, uh, uh, let me uh, see what we're going to uh, summarize here. Accordingly, we're going to go to this uh, page here. Uh, let's go to the registers. Again, another summary of the registers. And you can see how convenient that is. Uh, these are the registers. This is a register zero. These are all the fields inside of it. And this is an explanation of all the fields. So uh, uh, that's basically the stuff that we need to configure. But here is one thing. Before we start looking at these, we have to do one thing. We need to find out how we gonna divide and modulate the clock. We're starting with SMCLK at one megahertz. We need to set up 9,600 Hertz to transmit and 9,600 Hertz times 16 to receive because we're gonna receive with over sampling. So we're gonna look at how we can find the divider and modulators. And that's actually found somewhere in this chapter earlier, there's a big table. So let me scroll 
few pages earlier and I'm looking for the big table. Now it actually looks like this. Uh, but let me look. Uh, this is basically what I want. Uh, I have it highlighted here. Let's zoom in and and find this and look at it again. So this is what I need to find. This here is the clock I'm starting with. This is the clock I'm starting with. I am starting with SMCLK at one megahertz. Notice this is very close. This is two to the power 20, 1.048 megahertz. Our SMCLK should be 1.00 megahertz. I'm starting with this clock and I'm aiming for the baud rate of 9,600 baud. So obviously this is the row we are interested. In. These are different baud rates. And uh, we have the entry with oversampling. So apparently you could see here, sometimes they give you the entry without oversampling. So I think they really recommend oversampling because they might as well give you another entry without oversampling. It could be done with that, but apparently they didn't. And I'm completely fine with oversampling. So what you're gonna see here, these are the three numbers we need to write down. This is the divider. And these two are the modulator. The divider is actually very easy to, to compute. This is what the divider is. Uh, let me actually write them down here. Or let me write it here since I have the two numbers. The divider is basically, if we divide one megahertz by 9,600, I believe the answer is 104. And then furthermore, you divide by 16, you should get six point something. That's why the divider is six. So the divider is so easy, you can compute with a calculator. Now, the modulators compensate for the fractional part. They're not equal to the fractional part. They compensate for the fractional part because this guy is going to do modulation to make the clock accurate. And briefly, modulation is when you mix two frequencies, so you have a frequency that's in between them. That's basically what the hardware unit will do. So anyway. Let's go here and write it down. So family user's guide, EUSCI, UART mode, this turned out to be chapter 30, right? Chapter 30. And apparently we look at table 30.5, 30.5. And that's what I need to write. Uh, the divider is six. So UCBR is equal to six. UCBRF, this is one modulator equal to eight. UCBRS, that's another modulator equal to 20 in hexadecimal, zero X, 20. So I'm gonna write these down because I'm gonna need to use them in my configuration. And that's pretty much it. Now we are ready to go to the registers and we can start activating or uh, putting our configuration. All right, here are the registers at the end of the chapter. <coughs> so in our case, X is equal to one because we are in we are using EUSCI module number one. So when we use these registers, it's gonna be called UCA1 control word zero. CTL means control. That means it's a configuration. Let's look what we have here. Uh, this is the parity enable. We decided we don't want parity. So this will be equal to zero, parity disabled. Uh, if you don't use parity, odd even doesn't matter. So I'm going to skip this. We want LSB first, right? So this bit is also equal to zero, LSB first. Uh, we want to transmit 8-bit data. Right, we want to transmit 8 bit data, so that also is equal to zero. Right, zero here. Uh, we want to transmit one stop bit. The popular configuration is one stop bit, so that's also equal to zero. We want UART mode, which is also equal to zero. The UART is considered asynchronous, that's also equal to zero. And if you guys notice, that's not a coincidence, they're all equal to zero. That's because the most popular configuration is mapped to all the entries equal to zero. That makes it easier for us to, 
to configure the most popular configuration. The clock is SMCLK. We can either use two or three, doesn't matter. And this is interrupt enable on erroneous character. We kind of ignore that for, a for now. This is a more advanced feature. We can do UART without that. This is a feature called break character interrupt enable. We're not going to use an interrupt. So let's leave this guy alone. It's disabled. That's the default value. It's disabled. So we don't, we're not going to enable it. And another feature called dormant uh, transmit address to mark the data address or data uh, transmit break. We're going to leave these alone. Here is one thing we need to worry about. Uh, this is called the reset. Uh, that means we can put the EUSCI module in reset. And apparently by default it is. And what that means, we should we can only change the configuration while in reset. So remember, now we're gonna activate our configurations. So this guy, I need to change it to two or to three, but we're not supposed to change the configuration unless we enter reset. So that's basically how the procedure work. Actually, I've written some of it here. So let's write a function called void initialize UART. Okay, this is a void initialize UART. The first thing we're gonna do is enter reset, even though it's already entered, but I'm gonna write this code assuming we're not from reset state. Maybe the microcontroller was running and we changed this. So first thing we're gonna do is enter reset. So remember this register for us is UCA1 CTL control word zero. That guy is zero. So UCA1 CTL control word zero uh, or equal UCSW reset. So now we enter the reset state, okay? Then we're gonna activate all our configuration here. And at the very end, we're gonna exit reset and then close up the function. That's how you can do the configuration. So enter the reset, configure everything you want, and then exit the reset. So I'm gonna do another thing here. I'm not gonna rely on the reset values. I'm gonna write this from scratch. So even though if these were other values, I wanna change them to what I want. So what I'm gonna write here, just one subtle change, I wrote that register is equal to reset. So what this is gonna do, uh, reset bit is one, all other bits are zero. Does that make sense what I did here? So look guys what I did. I set this register to that particular bit. I wrote equal, not or equal. So when you do equal, it means that guy will get one that guy will get one, so we are in reset, but all the others get zero, which you could see the reset value is zero after you start your microcontroller. But even though they weren't because the code has changed them, all of these will go back to zero. So therefore, I'm only gonna change the one that should be non-zero because at that point I ensured that everything is zero. So this should be zero, I will leave it alone. This should be zero, should be zero. I want zero here, zero here. And it looks like uh, I want this to be two or three, the clock. So here's what I'm gonna write now. Uh, UCA one, control word zero. Now I need to do or operation, right? Because I don't wanna exit the reset. I wanna stay in reset, but on top of that, I'm gonna add some other bit fields. Let me do three here. So UCS select, UCS select underscore three, and that means SMC, okay. So now I selected my clock. Remember, I'm still in the reset. I only did OR operation, only this field will change. We're gonna stay in reset, obviously. And as you can see, we are done with that register. Let's look at the next register. This register is called control word one. And I don't think we need to deal with that. This had some fine tuning operation, like take care of glitching. These are very tiny duration in nanoseconds to deal with signal glitch. So I will leave this alone. This is where we're gonna write the BR. Remember, we find the divider, the BR word. And if you notice, the BR occupies the whole register. It's basically a 16-bit number. And you can see here what it says, can only be modified when reset is one, when we are in reset state, which we are. 
So because it occupies the whole register, that makes it so easy. Remember x equal to one in our case. So UCA one BRW is equal to six. You just do equal to that value because it occupies the whole register. So we took care of this, of the divider. And you're gonna find that the two modulators, UCBRF, UCBRS, are located in this. I think M means modulator. Yes, that's what it is. Modulation control word register. So modulation control word. This is UCBRS, occupies a bunch of bits. And that's UCBRF. And this is the oversampling 16 times. Remember, we are doing oversampling in our case, right? So we are doing oversampling activated. So that bit, we kind of change it to one. Uh, you can see I'm going to write to everything. So I'm going to do equal in that case, since I'm modifying all the bit fields. So x is equal to 1, uca1, mctl word is equal. And now here's an interesting catch. The way the bit fields are defined, we cannot do underscore. And the reason is this guy has from bit 8 to bit 15, these are 8 bits. It has 255 possible masks. So they did not define 255 possible masks in the header file, right? When I use a mask here, this is defined in the header file. So what they instead de define, they define one mask for every bit without the underscore. So the mask UCBRS0 is this, UCBRS1 is this, UCBRS2, S3 up to S7. So I'm going to merge my bits. So let me write this in binary. This is equal to this in binary, right? This is eight, one, two, four, eight. And that's actually bit number three, zero, one, two, three. So I'm gonna simply select uh, UCBRS three, no underscore. You're not choosing the value of three. It's not gonna be one, one. You're choosing only bit three. It's gonna be one, zero, zero, zero. So let me write this down here, UCBR, S3 or quiz. Uh, let's take care. Oh, uh, sorry, guys, I made a small mistake. UCBRF, this is F. So UCBRF is this, so that means F3. Okay, doesn't really change anything. So now when you look at these guys, it's going to be UCBRF3, right? So that guy. But doesn't matter where it's location because this mask will find its location. So UCBRF3, that takes care of this. Let's do the same for UCBRS. So I'm going to write it in binary. I have two zero, so it looks like this. This is two and this, right? So let's see what we are dealing with here. This is a bit zero, bit one, bit two, bit three, bit four, bit five. It's only bit five, so therefore, UCBRS5. That's what I'm going to put here. UCBRS5. And now these two guys have been uh, configured 8 and hexadecimal 20. Uh, and I'm just going to look uh, quickly uh, on the family user's guide. Uh, whoops, sorry, I was already in the family user's guide. Uh, was it 20 or 22? Let me just make sure I copied that correct. Yeah, it is 20. 20 is a correct value. Okay, so so now we activated 8 and 20, and I'm, I'm going to activate the oversampling. So or UCOS 16, and that's pretty much it. Now this configuration is active. Obviously, it would be nice to put some comment. Uh, you can copy these down here, right, to say what we were doing. Uh, UCBRF is this. Uh, UCBRS is this. Uh, <clears throat> so this kind of shows in the code. So anyways, let's see what we have here. Uh, that's really the most important part. Here we have register called status. Uh, you can read into this. 
but we don't necessarily have to use it. This is an overrun flag. If we receive a byte and we receive a new one without reading the old byte and they overwrote each other, that's how we know with this flag. But anyways, these are really not very important or not necessary just to do a basic UART send and receive. Uh, anything you transmit, you transmit in the TX buffer, it will be UCA1 TX buff. When you receive, you receive in the RX buffer. Uh, okay, this is another register. Uh, and let me see the transmit flag. If we want to create interrupt when we transmit and interrupt when we receive, these are the enable, they're located here. And the transmit and receive flag, they are located here. I'm not gonna go over these here because obviously you're gonna use the flags and TX buff and RX buff to write the code to transmit and receive. So I was mainly focusing here on how to configure that. So at that point, actually that's the whole configuration. Um, so that's pretty much it. So let me go back to here. The very last thing I'm gonna do is exit the reset. Okay, and you can see this here, uh, UCA1 control word zero, that's basically the inverse of this guy. You say one control word zero, now we can exit the reset state. The transmit and receive function are given in lab eight. So that's where you can find the transmit and receive function. And at that point, once you call this function in your code, oh, by the way, I probably would like to put these into the configuration function. Because remember, the very first thing you need to do is divert the pins, right? So I would put this here and say code to divert pins to UART, right? And that will be my whole configuration function. So let's go over this very quickly. To initialize UART, we divert the pins, the back channel UART pins to UART functionality. We enter the reset state in our module we activated all our configuration. We found out that we need zero for most of them. No flow control, LSP, one stop bit, no parity. All of these were zero. That made our work easier. This sets everything to zero. And then we chose our clock. Uh, these are the divider and modulators. This is the divider here. And these are the modulators. Now we have two modulators for transmit and receive. And we are doing oversampling 16. And finally, we exit the reset state. And at that moment, you can start sending and receiving over UART. So that's pretty much it uh, for uh, this video. And let's stop here.